what I want to talk about today is staffing your events to make sure they are successful for the players, for the organizer, and for the judges themselves. And one of the things that we're going to be talking about today is how to take a group of judges and break them into teams. Now, this is a room of people who are who are leaders who know who who probably think you probably think you know a few things about taking some judges and breaking them into teams. So what I'm about to ask you to do is break yourselves into teams. <laughs> So this is our, our first exercise. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, you're probably sitting with a lot of people, with some people that you know well, some people that you work with a lot, and if you want to create an effective team for yourself for this presentation, you it is, it is the onus is on you to create a team to work with that is that is a group of people that maybe you don't work with all the time, not just for a, a group of four people that you see every couple of weeks at your local events. So we need six groups of four to five judges. Um, go. <laughs> Looks like we have some groups. Thank you very much for doing that. I appreciate it. I know that asking everybody to move around at the very beginning of the day maybe is not uh, what everybody was hoping for, but I promise this will pay dividends. So, the first question that you might ask when we're talking about staffing events is where's the most? Is why is this important? Like, you know, let's say CJ and I are talking about staffing events, and I say, well, you know, let's say you have nine applicants for your MCQ and you got five spots, so how are you gonna how are you gonna staff them? If you're CJ Crooks, you might say, well, I'll just take the best five, throw them on some teams, and let them at it. Well, that might work, but it might not be the best thing for your MCQ or your Star City Regionals and similar type events that you might be asked to, to, to staff. Because if you're working with a tournament organizer, it's likely that you're going to be asked to at least give input on who's accepted and then take those accepted judges and create a structure for them to work with it. So you're going to be asked to do this and you might have some goals. Obviously one of the goals that you might have for an event that you're staffing is a quality event. Obviously this is the number one thing. You want to have the best event you can, right? And that's, you know, where CJ's mind was in this example here. But you also want to make sure that you create a growth environment for your, for the judges on your event. And don't forget, that includes you as a head judge. You want to have a happy tournament organizer and happy players. And if your, if your tournament organizer is comfortable with the staff that you've created, if they're comfortable with the judges that they're working with overall, you're going to have a better relationship with them, they're going to have a better relationship with the judges that you have staffed, the players are going to be happier, everybody's going to be happier. This is about promoting some harmony. And of course, strengthening the judge community. If you have judges that work together well already, you might want to think about Introducing some more judges into that group, finding ways to bring other people in so that the community of judges that work well together gets larger over time. Yeah. So, one of the things we're going to have to do before you staff your event, like I mentioned before, is interact with the tournament organizer. I had an interaction with a tournament organizer a few weeks ago when I was asked to head judge uh, an upcoming MCQ. In, in St. Louis, and I said, hey, what if this time, because last time was, was their first MCQ, their first event of this, this type, and I said, okay, you're just gonna staff it with who you staff it with, that's fine, but this time, what if we put the event on judge apps and took applications? And my TO, this is a paraphrased message from him, because obviously I'm not gonna take his message, He's, he said basically, why should we make a Judge Apps event? I feel like getting a set crew to work with would be good for the store, since we'll be running these 
hopefully every time they come around, every wave of MCQs will be getting one. So why not just have the same crew every time? So, why not just have the same crew every time? Steven. Well, not all those judges of your set crew are necessarily going to be available. Some might stop judging and move out of the region or you know, have some event to go to. And if you're faced with this big gap in staffing that you suddenly have to fill with maybe inexperienced judges or judges you're not familiar with, then that particular event might not go as well. So it, there's actually pretty strong incentive for you as, or for the TO, to sort of grow some judges and start integrating them into that local group of judges so you have a bigger pool to consistently staff from. Definitely. Jim, I saw your, you know, you had the same my one. Answer pretty, very right here. Hey, you start new ideas and you start new growth dramatically because if it's the same group of people doing things the same exact way, they're going to get into a pattern. Mm. If someone else comes in, maybe has new ideas, new suggestions, why don't we do it this way? You kind of cut that entire avenue off of innovation just entirely. Yeah. So let's have a record of the event. Who was on staff for that event? Just in general, let's put it on judge apps anyway. Yeah. Even if, even if it is a standard crew, let's get it on judge apps anyway. Let's let's have a record anyway, so that when those folks are applying for things in the future, they can say, "I worked this, yeah. this MCQ," and it's not, "Did you? I can't find that on judge apps anywhere." Uh, so it's kind of like with uh, John's, um, but in a different route. It's, it's the same groups, not only the groups, but they're complacent. So mm. if every event is running the same way, their quality of judging might go down because. Hey, everything's going to swim. All of a sudden, we're going to have this one event. Everything hits the wall. What are we going to do? It makes the other judges in your area super resentful and causes a lot of issues between judges in uh -huh. your community. This is a big one. Very if you have the MCQ judges and the not MCQ judges, it's very easy for that to start looking like the haves and the have-nots. And we all know how well that does. <laughs> I mean, usually it's not a musical number, but I get your point. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. No, no one event is run perfectly. Yeah. So you get a, a group of, say, 10 events with different staffs. There's maybe one issue that's different with each one of them. But if you have the same staff for 10 events, you're going to start adding issues because of the set complacency and no actual growth. That's, that's the opposite of growth. Well, if I was a tournament organizer, you all would have convinced me. <laughs> because this is basically the same stuff I said to my TO. He said, yeah, it makes sense. He was engaging in some short-term thinking, and and, and 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 you've gotten this this tournament organizer talking about this. You've gotten this this fiction, semi-fictitious tournament organizer into some long-term thinking, and that's that's what we need here. So, before you're staffing, before you actually start staffing the event, obviously somebody needs to open applications, ideally on Judge X. and so you sort of have to ask yourself and the tournament organizer. How many judges do you need? What roles do you need these judges in? Do you need, you have a head judge? Are you the head judge? Do you need a head judge? Are you gonna have one team of judges or do you need some separate team leads? Uh, is your event of a very predictable size or does your tournament organizer want to have any standby judges? If so, how do they wanna handle that? Uh, this graphic up here, you may be familiar with. This is the program coordinator's recommended staffing guidelines <coughs> as a reminder. Wizards of the Coast does not, cannot, will not impose any staffing guidelines on your tournament organizer. So these are some lovely suggestions from our program coordinators that I recommend you share with, with TOs as you work with them because, frankly, they're pretty good. I like them. Um, so make sure that as you're working with tournament organizers, if they are, if, they, if you say how many judges are you looking for for this event, and they say, well, you know, I'm not sure. What do you think? You might want to not just talk to them about that event, but share this table with them to, to sort of help them figure things out as they go along in the future. <coughs> when you're staffing, you want to think about, what's up, Jim? Is there a URL for that link somewhere? Um, I know it's out there. I know I, I deal with it, but I, I know to my send it to you, Jim. The, Thank you, Meg. I yep. will tell you that the way I consistently find it is by Googling Magic Program Coordinator Staffing Guidelines. So, you know, okay. it's, I think it's currently the third or fourth entry on the Program Coordinator's <coughs> blog. I've seen it. I don't yeah. know where it is. I was just... 
you know, I, I, I really have to, as, as with many magic-related resources, I have the most, the most success with a, with a cure, with a, with a Google search. So, you know, that's how things go sometimes. Um, but, but when you're staffing, when you're creating your applications, there are some things you want to think about. What mix of levels do you want on this event? What kind of experience and skills? And this is not justified by level, obviously. Do you, are the judges at this event going to need to have? And why? You know, what kind of event is this? Is this a you know <coughs> an an end of year event where players who have played a lot at a particular store are coming together to play for you know some big prize that the store has set up? Is this Star City Regionals that's going to pull in judges and pull in players from all over the area, somewhere in between? What kind of skills are these judges going to need for these different sizes and types of events? You're also going to want to think about some more mundane stuff like when should applications close? When are you going to process applications? And make sure you can nail down the TO on what the compensation is that you can publish that on Judge Apps too. Go for it, Jim. I'm going to ask you a quick question on dealing with that on Friday. When do you put it up? In your guideline, what do you feel most comfortable with when you put yours up and when you close it? How far out? So, for something like an MCQ, if I, if I, you know, if I were applying to an MCQ, you know, that wasn't around the corner, I probably want to know if I was going, you know, three weeks in advance. It would be really nice to know three weeks in advance if I was going to be driving out there, if I was going or not. And so with that in mind, I'd probably open the applications five weeks beforehand just to make sure people had a, a nice window and then, you know, try to get a quick turnaround on it. But if I, if I know two, three weeks before the event that I'm going or not going, that helps me out a lot. And it depends what the travel is going to be like for the event. Um, if you're staffing mostly local folks and, you know, any, any backup judges that you have in case somebody bows out are also going to be local enough, you know, within an hour's drive, something like that, then that window can be shorter. But if you're pulling people from further, I would extend that. So what you're saying the further out is the bigger the event, the further out you look at closing it because people may be traveling for it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Carter. So uh, elements to consider is uh, as soon as possible is always preferred. Mm -hmm. The sooner you open the uh, app and the longer the app is open, the more people will potentially be accessible now if you if you leave it open too long yeah. there are people that are waiting for a reply that will accept other offers right yes so you certainly oh. don't want to have your window be too short or too close to the event um, the other element that's super relevant is how well does the message get out to the community that a new app is up not everybody has things set up uh, to you know ping them when a new app goes up so if, uh, especially if you're working with a store who doesn't have an established judge community relationship, uh, additional legwork on getting that message out through groups and stuff might be necessary. Uh, three weeks, I would recommend as a minimum for heads up on having processed the applications, simply because I think if you go closer to that, you're gonna run into other events, but more likely, family commitments at uh, the LGS uh, in regional level. A thing that we do in our region is every month we start a new thread and each comment on the thread is this application is open, this application has one week left, this application for this thing, for any event that people could reasonably be going to from our region so that people can subscribe to the thread so they know when things are closing and it helps really get that word out about stuff. That's some good, yeah. No, that's not Facebook. It's in our Facebook group. And then it's got a bot in our Slack or Discord. I don't do space magic. I don't know. Someone else makes that work. Yeah, there's some kind of robot that does that and and, uh, and it tells everybody what they're, where to go and everybody's happy. And uh, if your region does not have a robot, find someone who can make a, make a robot out of space magic uh, because those are great. Uh, moving on to mouse finding 101. Uh, when you're staffing an event, once you've got applications and when you're processing them, there are a lot of things to consider. Obviously, you have a lot of information coming in and you have to make decisions based on that. Again, you want to talk, think about roles and team structure. How many teams does your event need? 
who's going to lead those teams and what are their relations? What are their uh, responsibilities going to be? Do you need a scorekeeper, or has the tournament organizer already gotten that for you? Is that something that you need to be staffing for? And if you, if that's something you need, who has the skills to be the scorekeeper at the event to make to make it seem like everything goes smoothly and there's never a problem, even when inevitably there is some problem? Uh, I also want to want to talk about the concept of rocks and reaches. This is something that I talked about that, that I know Paul Barony wrote an article about some time back that I've talked to him about uh, a decent number of times where if you have somebody who you say, well, I want, to, I want this person to get a shot, they're close, but I feel like maybe they're not quite there where they need to be. They might be a reach for that particular role of team lead or judge of the event, and so you might need a rock to support them, somebody who you know is reliable, somebody you know, well, if this person was the team lead, I wouldn't even have to worry about deck checks or whatever it is. So I'll make sure they're on the team with this person who's, you know, maybe learning, maybe needs a little more experience, but should have a resource to work with if they're not sure what to do. Giving that person a resource to work with to learn from is going to enable them to succeed and fail safely and without impacting the event too much. You also want to think about, and this is sort of connected to that, mentorship and learning. Who has which skills that you need at the event? Who's, who's developing those skills? And how can you try to pair those judges together so that the judges who are learning those skills can <coughs> learn from the experts? Who already works together a lot? And this is something that we talked about when we were making our teams earlier for this presentation. If you have judges who already work together a ton, sometimes that can be an asset. If you, again, if you have something that you say, okay, Today, I don't want to have to worry about how deck checks go. I know these two judges work well together. I'm going to take that. I'm going to put them on the deck checks team, and they're going to they're going to take care of it, no problem. Or, again, if you have somebody who you say, okay, they know how to do these things, who can teach them other skills that they may not have that they can then bring back to their area? Well, probably somebody they don't work with a lot. Probably somebody that's not local to them. Sometimes we have to worry a little bit about keeping the peace. I know this is a one, one big family and we all love each other very much, but sometimes there are personality conflicts in the judge program. I've had my share of those. Uh, are there personality conflicts in play when you're looking at the staffing? Is that something that you might want to consider? Are there judges who feel like they're not getting chances? Say, people who didn't get on that MCQ that wasn't on judge apps. Why aren't those judges getting chances? Is there anyone in particular that the tournament organizer wants to staff or not staff? You need to make sure you communicate with them about that. If they if they say, well, you know, I understand you want to staff that judge, but unfortunately they're banned from my store because they took a swing at me a couple weeks ago. Well, you probably shouldn't staff that judge. There's obviously less extreme versions of that, right? But but that's something to consider. You also want to solicit. If, if you have time, you may also want to solicit feedback on some of these applications. Who does the tournament organizer know and work with? Does, the R, does your RC know these judges? And do they have feedback that they can give you about these judges? Are there other leaders in this area that can give you helpful insights about what these judges know, what they don't know? Who trained these judges and who works with them a lot? Those are other resources that can give you feedback on, you know, if, if CJ certified me, then he might know a thing or two about what I can and can't do. And one last question to ask yourself, especially if you're new to staffing events, do you want help? Because as RC, I know I've said, I, I've helped people staff events when they've said, hey, I'm not totally sure, I've got this pool of applicants, I'm not totally sure what to do. Or even in circumstances where the TO is an expert, somebody who's done plenty of events, they've said, you know, I would, I would like, uh, you know, the head judge and I would like your input on some of this stuff. Those are definitely things that, like reaching out for help and getting more information, as long as you have the time to digest that information and use it appropriately, can be really helpful. A couple more things to talk about before we get to the fun part here. Another, another thing that we don't necessarily love to think about, but is absolutely true, biases. You have them, I have them, we all have them. And the most important thing we can do with those is to recognize our biases and try to figure out how to counteract them. 
you're going to have positive biases towards your friends, people you work with a lot, people you see frequently, people who you interact with a lot. You may have negative biases towards people you're not familiar with, somebody you had a one-off negative interaction with, or somebody who maybe is a great judge, but you, you and them just don't get along super well. And trying to figure out ways to counteract that, usually by trying to involve other perspectives, other ideas, other people in the staffing process is really important. Because if you're in charge of staffing, if you're head judging all the MCQs in your local area, and you're not, you're not getting any help staffing them, or you're not getting anybody else's input, you may, without thinking about it, because we're good people, but you may, without thinking about it, be falling victim to your own biases. And people may be losing opportunities that they, should, they, they otherwise should have just as a result of your human brain. It doesn't make you a bad person that you have you know, this type of bias. It, what matters is that you work to counteract that. The other important thing is to think about when does feedback expire? So let's say Carter and I worked together eight months ago, and Carter watched me just punt the hell out of a ruling eight months ago. I just, at, you know, all the way down the field, can't even see that ruling anymore. It's gone so far. Eight months ago, and that was the last time Carter saw or talked to me. Is that useful? No, I'm seeing some shaking heads. And yes, CJ's yeah. in. Yeah. CJ's ready to cut yeah. you from, from the staff. No, it's useful. I didn't say I was going to cut you from the staff. It can be. It's that kind of leading yes. question you follow up to see what have you done to improve your knowledge on an area? Yes. What has this person done? How did this person react to the mistake that they made? What did they do? Did was Mr. This Carter just, give you feedback at the time? Right. Did Carter give me feedback at the time and say, hey, why'd you do that? Or did he just roll his eyes and walk away from me? <laughs> you know? Figuring out what that, what that mistake was and how that judge reacted to the mistake, how they worked on or didn't work on the, uh, the consequences of the error that made, whether they, they apologized to the people that they, that they made the mistake at, I guess, that sentence didn't go great, you understand me. All these things are important, and just knowing that that judge made a mistake in a vacuum, or a year ago you had a, a, a conflict with this judge at an event, knowing just that in a vacuum isn't going to help you. You have to seek out more information if you want to be fair to this judge. And you want to be fair to this judge, because if you just exclude them without thinking about it, your event may be the worst for it. Uh, the other side of this is something like, before this judge, you know, lapsed, they were a great team lead, and they've been gone for a while, and now they're back. Uh, are they still a great team lead? Maybe. You don't know, without asking questions. Maybe what they do at work is very much like team leading at a magic event, and they probably still have at least those leadership skills to hand. Or, you know, maybe they've been deep, in deep, deep sleep for the last two years and have forgotten how to do it all together. Obviously, the answer is likely to be somewhere in between, but if all you know is this one kernel of information and you don't take a couple steps to investigate past that, you might be missing out on a great resource. So, after staffing, what to do? One of the most important things to do is communicate results in a timely manner. If you have staffed someone, if you haven't staffed someone, if you put somebody on standby, the most important thing to do once you've made those decisions is tell your judges. It doesn't matter how early you, you figure out who's on staff if you don't tell these judges. Because if they don't know, they're going to make other plans. Um, and then there's the issue, the question of how to give feedback to judges that you might not accept. I've been on a lot of events, both on the accept and the decline side, where the tournament organizer or the head judge has said, oh, absolutely we'll give feedback to everybody who, who, who we declined. Guess how many times I've gotten that feedback when I've been declined? One time, Brian Spellman is correct. The answer is once, and that feedback was delivered to me in person the next day because I happened to see that human being. And if I hadn't seen them, the answer would be zero. It seems really easy, but it's actually difficult because it doesn't just involve thinking about, okay, well, why didn't we staff this person? It involves actually communicating it to the person. And as we know, delivering that kind of feedback can be hard. 
I'm not saying you have to do it for every event you staff. I'm certainly not saying that because time is limited and our lives are short, but don't promise it unless you can deliver it. That's, you gotta, just got to take ownership of that. That's the, that's the lesson here. So, now that I'm really done with all my talking at you slides, let's practice. We're going to staff some events. No, they're not real events. These applications that you're about to read are not real. All of these events, stores, locations, and judges are works of fiction. Any resemblance to events, stores, or judges, current or former, is purely coincidental. And now that I've given you my law and order disclaimer, you know now why you split into groups. Because what you're about to do is you're about to staff an MCQ. And you, this hive mind of four or five judges together, are the head judge of this wonderful MCQ at Eclipse Games on the moon. Uh, it is a sealed deck MCQ, and the tournament organizer estimates that there will be about 150 players at the event. You are the head judge. You need judges and a scorekeeper. When you ask the TO, how many judges do you want for this event, they said, I don't know, you figure it out. You show me a staff and I'll tell you yes or no. The venue can hold up to 200 players. That is the maximum number of players that could be at the event. <coughs> and because the, uh, the previous uh, MCQ head judge skilled person on the moon had to ship off to another galaxy, you are not local to the moon, you are from Earth. And except for one applicant who you encourage to apply, you don't know the people applying to this event. So, where can you find the applications for this event? Well, in two places. First, I'm going to pass out the applications to you on some pieces of paper, but if you're a digital type person, you can also find them here. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fan. Yeah. That's factually <laughs> true. <laughs> yes. There seems to be a whole lot of right answers and not an overwhelming amount of wrong answers. Yeah. So sometimes, one of, the, one of the things that this exercise was supposed to show you was there's not one right answer to this thing. There's not, I don't have an answer sheet for you for the right staff for the MCQ, right? That doesn't exist. There were a lot of possibilities. If you put one person in the event, that might lead you to decline someone that somebody else would have accepted. And neither of those answers is necessarily wrong. They're just different. And they have different consequences. Anything else? When you're dealing with people that you don't know at all, or like, um, wording in your cover letter is extremely important to be able to tell us what you can do. Yes. Like, when you we love seeing goals and like that you have aspirations and initiative to do something, but we also need to know what you can do. <laughs> Isn't it interesting to read nine or ten cover letters and go, I think I, I think I know a good amount about two or three of these people. <laughs> it might teach you something about your own cover letters for events, maybe by design perhaps. <laughs> Anything else? Any clever? Meg, go for it. I learned something from real life the first time I was a real life judge manager. Cool. Which is. Uh, if you're the one hitting the publishing button, you have to hit accept and decline separately and publish it twice. Oh, that's fun. It doesn't do it automatically, and then people call you asking why their application is still pending. That's a, that's a good procedural note. Any, anything else? Any clever things that you... Any, anything clever that you did while you were staffing this event that you feel like, oh, I feel really good about that, and I want to say it out loud. Meg? Trillian wants more experience scorekeeping, and Slarty Bartfast is like, I've uh, score kept at Grand Prix and stuff, so Slarty Barkfest can be on the event helping out these level ones with judging stuff, but also if Trillian's drowning in scorekeeping, can go over and help with scorekeeping. Look at this. We found our, our, re our useful resource that can help anchor the whole event. Amazing. You won't always have that. We're very lucky on the moon this day to have Slarty Barkfest. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Uh, we, we put 
Slaughter Burn Pass as a uh, second standby mm -hmm. uh, to be activated if we get up to 200 players so that he can play, but can also, if we need him, uh, if, if things are, are drowning, we can pull him yeah. and use him then. Sounds great. If we, yeah, if we start drowning in players, then, oh, well, maybe we need this experienced person to anchor the staff. Back to me. We asked the TO if we could have our standby judge play in the event for free if they didn't get activated. Ah, yes. A useful question. What is, what, how does standby work for this particular TO? Do they just, are they, is the TO just expecting them to show up and pay for the event if they don't judge? Because that's a really great way to have your standbys probably not show up for the event. Um, something to talk about, think about when you're working with your TOs. Steven. Uh, so we came up with a plan to ask the TO, well, we came up with a plan where we needed four, four judges, but we mm. decided to ask the TO, to present to the TO a staff that would buy four judges, expecting that the TO's going to want to negotiate a little bit on that. Ah, negotiation tactics, I like it. So we were willing to come back to four if we had to, hopefully the TO would take the staffing as we presented this. So your goal was to pre present the staff that where you say this would be a great event, we, we do a fantastic job, knowing that the TO might say, I need to cut you down to the bare bones staff here, and you said, okay, well, we have a, a backup plan for them. That's good, that's a good idea. But he failed to mention that the bartering tool we had, the fifth judge was his store employee that he wanted on staff. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, we, if we gotta go to four, this guy's gotta move to standby. So Marvin was our tactics. Yeah. <laughs> we might not be getting hired to head to again for this. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Go. So uh, we were able to give some feedback to a couple of the judges who weren't able to be staffed. Uh, yeah. for, for Zaphod, he seemed like a really strong applicant, but we just had a lot of other roles that needed to be filled. Uh, as he was a area captain, you know, that's generally a good, strong uh, rock, like you mentioned earlier. But uh, no, not this time, perhaps the next one for sure, a strong recommendation. So just kind of getting out the feedback to the people who were declined. Yeah. Was well, Zephod as a, an area captain on the light side of the moon? We actually paired him on deck checks with Eddie. The dark side of the moon, Judge. So that he could give Eddie some advice on how to develop his area. Oh, look at that. That's very clever. Also would give Eddie a chance to take calls, but only in half the round. Yes. Yes. I like this. All right. Well, it sounds like a lot of a lot of fun, clever decisions were made. I wish we had more time to do my second exercise, but unfortunately, again, linear time is linear and does end. We have closing thoughts. Closing uh, uh, last things. You had your hand. No. I I was actually going to be a nerd and ask if we could keep these. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Please go for it. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks for being part of this uh, this new different thing. <laughs>